Welcome to my presentation, Through Thick and Thin, Escaping the Iron Law of Business as Usual. This is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. It probably won't mean very much to you at this stage, but I will make my slides available and you're certainly welcome to have a look at them afterwards. So here is a picture of somebody and your task is to work out what they're doing. And of course, you would expect this to be a trick question. Uh, because the obvious answer is that they're playing golf, but in fact, they're practicing golf. And I use that to illustrate this idea of the difference between a thick and a thin description of a situation and a thick and thin understanding of a situation. Those two words were cooked up by Gilbert Ryle in a paper, I think, in 1949. He's an Oxford philosopher. And they were picked up by Clifford Goetz, a an anthropologist uh, in the early 70s and are quite well known in anthropology uh, and in social science generally, I guess now, rather less so in economics and public policy. But it seems to me that they're very important ideas and I'll just introduce them very briefly to you. And if you think about that example of uh, the golf example, whether someone's playing golf or practicing golf, the difference between a thin and a thick description is that a thicker description starts taking you from a, a statement about what, what a person's doing, to knowing something about why, knowing something about how they're doing. And also, one can then start directing one's attention to so that we know, so that we are knowing for a particular purpose. And that will become of some significance later on. And if we're thinking of problems like policy problems, our policy problem is land stewardship, then I distinguish between thin policy problems and thick policy problems. And thin pro policy problems are mechanical and Australia is very good at them. Uh, so here are a range of things that Australian policymakers are among the best in the world and indeed world le leaders in a number of areas. Uh, and there is a mechanical ability for uh, smart people, we hope, at the top to advise smart politicians. They're now we're starting to, you know, that's starting to, um, <laughs> these days, um, stretch our imagination a bit more. But the decisions are made at the top and they uh, th there is a system, an infrastructure there. We pull some levers and certain things happen. And if, if the policy is good, good things mostly happen. And there are the, the, the degree to which there are unintended consequences is relatively limited. And Australia leads the world at this. Now, let's think about thick policy delivery. Uh, I would not accuse us as being, um, uh, as being at the best in the world, but there are just oodles of areas all the other areas where you can't just pull a lever where you have to where where we have to get good at something those things australia isn't relatively speaking terrible uh compared to other countries it's just terrible absolutely <laughs> uh there is lots of room for improvement in all these areas uh and certainly we were better at these relatively speaking than the rest of the world we were certainly among the leaders 50, 100 years ago, rather more so than we are today. And stewardship of country is a thick policy problem. So let's have a bit more of a look at what I think an illustration of a, of a thick policy problem. You have policy up the top and you have delivery down here. From, from and, and the sort of thing I've built my thinking around has been the delivery of government services like child protection for abused and neglected children, um, corrective services, Aboriginal wellbeing programs and so on. And so those uh, things that I've just brought up on the screen there are relevant uh, in that context. Regarding land management and stewardship of country, I'd say uh, government services are of, of importance, farmers are of importance, and various communities 
uh, of various different ethnicities and degrees of control and wealth and so on all become relevant there. And here's the thing about this way I think of it, which is of a set of like arteries and capillaries. And that's those are the words of a close personal friend of mine from who, who died over 200 years ago, Adam Smith. And he was, a, he was well known as the founder of modern economics. He's also a philosopher. And this is from his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. It's quite a statement that the disposition to admire and almost worship the rich and the powerful, though necessary to maintain the order of society, is at the same time the most universal cause of corruption of our moral sentiments. Well, that's true in spades in a hierarchy, and it has all ki- it leads to all kinds of pathologies. And one of them is recorded there uh, by Peter Shergold uh, before he became the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. If there was a single cultural predilection in the public service, I would change it would be the unspoken belief that government policy is a higher function than delivering results. He made very similar, he, he then went, he spent decades in the public service, uh, five year, well, really 10 years as either the public service commissioner or the head of prime minister and cabinet. And I don't know what he would say, but his, let's be generous and say the impact of him trying to change that was marginal. So this is a huge problem, I think. And the problem is that with thick policy problems, learning most of the things you need to know are out in the field. And hierarchies for a hundred different but related reasons, some of which I'll go into, find it impossible for learning to actually properly go upwards and to be identified, nurtured, protected and projected and expanded within a hierarchy. And I might just say that my thinking on this really began in 1983 when I encountered the Toyota production system. And Toyota built a hierarchy that really cared about uh, learning at the bottom of that hierarchy and building the company's systems of accountability, uh, everything around that. Uh, And it's really been pondering that and a range of other things that's led me to the way that I think about this now. So now you remember that the second term was, I was going to talk to you about Lord Acton's fault line. Well, for 20 years, I've mentioned a joke and I've mentioned it as a sort of a flourish because it's clearly talking about an important thing. And only recently, only in the first, in the last six months when I was writing something about the Productivity Commission's draft Indigenous evaluation strategy, did I do what I think I might have done rather earlier, which is to take the joke away from the embellishments and put it at the centre of the analysis. Have you ever wondered why comedies seem to provide the best advice, uh, the best analysis, the most realistic analysis of government and hierarchies. Well, Lord Acton had a, had a joke which sums up a lot, and he said that rowing is the perfect preparation, he said, for public life, but one can also think of bureaucracies which are part of public life. It's the perfect preparation for public life because it enables you to go in one direction while you face in the other. And what I want to suggest to you is that I guess that idea may not be that foreign to you. We've all seen politicians say one thing and do another. But really what I want to suggest to you is that it's turtles all the way down, that this one thing happens at numerous different levels, and most of them are subliminal. Most of them are perpetrated by people who want to do the right thing and think they're doing the right thing. But at crucial moments, for instance, when their minister might be embarrassed, they actually don't pursue the mission statement that sits in the foyer. They do something else. They pursue the institutional imperatives. And if we can't 
describe that, keep it in the front of our mind, and then start to think of strategic ways we might be able to do something about it, we're going to go round and round and round in circles. So I want to give you six examples of Lord Acton's fault line at work. The first is doing one thing in general and the opposite in particular. And before I give you an example of this, I'll go directly uh, onto the next uh, thing because it's a version of the same thing, which is that you have independent oversight of something, but either it isn't too independent or you make it avoidable. So we've done this now in regulation for, uh, let me work it out now, it's getting on to, so 1986, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, 35 years. So in 1986, Bob Hawke announced uh, minimum effective regulation. And what was that? It sort of came out of an economic textbook. I thought it was a good idea at the time. And it said any new regulation needs to go through a regulatory impact statement. A little further thought leads you to think, hmm, that's regulating regulators. Are we getting ourselves <laughs> caught up in something here? I won't uh, labour why it doesn't work, but essentially what happens is that at the same time as having a policy of, uh, against red tape, uh, politicians are able to say that they are getting rid of red tape while in particular they will introduce more red tape. Think about all the consents you sign and all kinds of things. And the other one, uh, another good example is freedom of information. And we discuss freedom of information as if giving uh, people access to their records and to records of government, and I'm not arguing against doing this, but we argue it as if doing it won't have any effect. And it has two effects, one of which is that it drives information outside official channels. Um, and of course, it, 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 there are lots of other easier ways to avoid the problem, which is delays, uh, particular sections of Freedom of Information Acts and so on. And when uh, we see analyses of these things, those, those, those difficult par paradoxical things are very often not the things that are pursued, not the things that are chased up. Uh, and so serious government um, serious planning and so on takes place without people at that strategy meeting saying, well, you know that we're kidding ourselves, don't you? You know that what happens is this and that. That's, that's impolite. Another technique, and in fact, increasingly, uh, this is something to pay real attention to. And of course, it's, uh, this is not, I guess, th that heading there, make announcement, is, is um, not a surprise to you. Uh, we make announcements again and again. In fact, we're in real trouble here. Um, the developing world, the less, the, the, the less rich part of the world, was always known as uh, a place where foreign aid would often provide the uh, money to build things that foreign ministers can turn up and, you know, tug a little cord and cut a ribbon on an asset, but no money to maintain it. And now that is, a, that is to a very substantial extent, a simple example of the fact that this has become a developed country problem. But I only use infrastructure because it's a nice thing I can show you a picture of. This problem is much deeper than that. And there's a marvelous report now, I think three or four years old from the Institute for Government in London it's called All Change. Um, you'll find a link to it in my slides. And what it documents is the incredible amount of churn. It just goes through three uh, portfolios, regional government, further education, and industrial strategy. As you can see, uh, a nice way of summarizing this is that we get a new eight to 12 year industrial strategy around about it, well, it used to be only every three or four years. And as you can see, uh, it was speeding up when this report went to press. That's completely hopeless. What's happening is if you are engaged in industrial strategy and that isn't at the front of your mind, you're, you haven't turned up, you're not being serious. And most people are not uh, because that would be being impolite.
uh, we do this very much in Aboriginal uh, affairs uh, and we do huge changes and grand announcements constantly, but the uh, portfolio doesn't have a high status and we cycle different ministers and different structures and, and so on and so forth. Four, announce grand goals, but don't focus on how to deliver them. This is a huge thing. We've recently had Jacinda Ardern tell us that New Zealand is getting a wellbeing budget, that they're now going to target improving the wellbeing of New Zealanders, which is a very nice idea. The basic problem there is that there's no connecting up of the instruments of government to the process of measuring and seeking to improve wellbeing. What the wellbeing budget was, was five themes announced. Some of them sounded that they, that it's, it's, it's government by word association. We say that child wellbeing is a theme and therefore it's part of a wellbeing budget. You'd think maybe we were organising a ball and we were deciding, trying to decide whether we would all come as pirates or as um, from the, you know, as Elvis or something. Um, and then one of the themes was innovation. Well, uh, call me call me suspicious, but I think innovation would have appeared in any budget. Um, and uh, what I'm getting at is there is no singular focus on how it is that we will do things differently to bring about this new goal. Uh, another one is evidence-based policy. Apparently, New South Wales announced an evidence-based policy a while ago. They're going to have evidence-based uh, policy. And then the Auditor General did a report on it of several months in, uh, several years in the conclusion the New South Wales government's program evaluation initiative is largely ineffective. No information is provided on the performance of programs that have been evaluated. Case closed. Uh, here's another big one. Whenever you're at, when you're at your next retreat, when you see uh, another one of these frameworks, these are some questions you might want to ask yourself. We produce a framework and a framework is almost invariably, uh, in fact, just to interrupt myself, um, we didn't have these frameworks, these nice pictures with nice words on them. We didn't have them 50 years ago, but schools ran very well, um, you know, hospitals. Uh, so, so there's something pretty strange going on here. So we produce a framework. We love that they, it's got nice words in it. They describe our values, if you like, our objectives, what we should do. They, that not only do they not help us work out how to do it, they actually distract attention from how to do it because that's what, if you have to go on retreats, and I've been known to feign death to avoid them, um, if, if you're to go on a retreat, if you are to think about uh, take uh, some kind of stock take with a view to moving forward. Um, how are you going to? Uh, that's what it should focus on. So uh, here, knowing what displaces knowing how. And here's the Productivity Commission's review of their draft Indigenous evaluation strategy. That's their framework. Uh, it's very nice. You could uh, uh, they're, they're nice words, credible, useful, ethical, transparent. You just it's a little embarrassing to ask. Uh, well, why did they put that? In? Could they put in other words? Because they could have put in other words. So you have to ask, what is this about? And it's certainly not about working out what things we know how to do and we do well, and what things we don't, and what we have to work on, and so on. Finally. And I want to talk about uh, the sixth thing that happens, and I think this is most relevant for our, uh, for our purposes here. You imagine a market, but you don't build one. What the hell could I mean? Well, I think what happens, in fact, if you think about what, what senior government, both politicians and senior government people think, and what lots of people think, that there is a kind of a market in social services, and it works like this, that there are lots of experiments going on, lots of people doing new things, new NGOs, governments are doing pilots and so on, and we will pick the things that work and we'll scale those up, and the things that aren't working, we'll scale them down a bit. It's a nice idea. It's something which is in the back of pretty much everyone's mind, 
and we don't do it at all. And I can prove to you, I mean, the fact is that it's impossible. I've now challenged audiences around the country to name something which scaled up to a national program from a um, uh, from a from a you know a seed planted somewhere. Uh, now, in fact, it's nice that we're talking about land stewardship because I think the last example of that is land care from the 1980s. So this mechanism. Uh, can work in a way if a prime minister grabs hold of a, something that's working and announces a national program. But it, there's no example of something growing from a small seed and gradually um, displacing other things. And there should be, if, if, if this idea we have in our heads is correct, there should be lots of these things. And let me prove this to you, because what happens if you go to government and you say, I've got this program and look at all the things that it's doing and look at all the external benefits of this program and how it generates external benefits for people nearby, what government will say is, well, you know, everyone says that. So you should go and you should get an independent evaluation. And so you go off to uh, Deloitte or if I'm lucky, Lateral Economics, and we do an evaluation for you, and it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then you come back a long time later, and you say, there it is, my independent evaluation, and they look a bit embarrassed, and they say, oh, yes, thank you for that. Don't call us, we'll call you. And as if it, if it, isn't, if it goes anywhere, it goes to a central agency, Department of Finance, look at it and say it's not independent, which it isn't, because it's been commissioned by... The, somebody with who's trying to tell a story, uh, who paid for it, and uh, goodness me, uh, I hope I, I'm not shocking you, but some consultants will tell a story that their client wants them to tell. So um, this, the, the, and that's just the basics. And I, you know, I published an article about this several years ago, and no one takes any interest. So we're not paying attention. We're not thinking about our Lord Acton problem. We're part of the problem. So I wanted to use that last example to try to ask the question, what instruments do we have? This problem is so subtle and so many layered. Is there some way that we can use things that exist in the system to try and hold the system to better account? And so I would say a minimum necessary to escape something like Catch-22 would be a clear understanding of what kind of evaluations are required, a removal of conflicts of interest in commissioning them. That means governments and all the community of interest needs to highlight this as an issue and come up with some principles and some, probably a bit of money to solve this problem. Some degree of level playing field between new initiatives and the status quo, that's tricky. Uh, a lot of people like to defend the status quo, but that's that's the next stage. It's not necessary to get something going, but that's the next stage. And some central verifiable undertaking to consider them. And then we could have some kind of biennial stock take of spreading innovation. So the Auditor General could report regularly on the state of pilots and other exploratory innovation at the edge of the system. Uh, how is the best innovation identified? What's been upscaled and downscaled? And here's a point that I stress, which is I don't want the system to absorb all these things as if they're little nuggets of explicit knowledge. These things are know-how. So a critical question is to ask ourselves, as programs are scaling up, are we identifying people who know how to do things and giving them more agency in the system and so on. So finally, I just want to mention that I've spent a lot of time reading about the Mont Pelerin Society, and some of you may recognise some people in that picture. Friedrich Hayek, the famous right-wing economic philosopher, is, was the architect of this, and these guys changed the world. They started in 1947, and there I have put before you one of the critical things that Friedrich Hayek said in his opening address. And what he's basically saying is, if we get ourselves mesmerized with trying to sell little hacks to politicians, we won't get anywhere. We have to try to come up with a coherent view of what we want. And we have to 
sketch that intellectual clarity is absolutely incredibly important and some consensus about what is most important. In other words, we, we need a vision which does not spare the susceptibilities of the mighty, which is not too severely practical, which does not confine itself to what today appears as politically possible. I do not mean by that anything terribly radical in the asks that are made of politicians or the system. I mean by that the arrival at a clear view of the importance of some of the things that I've talked about, uh, which there isn't, uh, there absolutely isn't at the moment. So, uh, and if you think about how change has happened in Australia, this is how change has happened. In 1968, Professor Max Corden said that tariff policy was an academic issue and would never change in Australia in his lifetime. Five years later, there was the 25% tariff cut. 15 years later, it was all over and an announcement was made for essentially or close to zero tariffs. Those governments didn't see themselves as doing anything terribly radical, but changes in the climate of opinion about what really mattered, that had changed. And if we want to change some of these things, that's how we have to go about it, in my opinion. So the preconditions are an identification of the problem, a clear identification of the problem, intellectual work proposing a response, and I haven't given you much of that, but I have proposed some, some th ideas there, a broad consensus behind that work that's worked for tariffs, tax reform, the NDIS and land care, it was working for Greenhouse before it got derailed. Now, I'm not quite sure what promises I can make in the area of land stewardship, but I did say similar things to some community groups a few months ago uh, because I wanted to end with a kind of call to action. And so with a, this call to action is so, somewhat in brackets, but if anyone's interested in this, uh, I'd certainly be happy to have further discussions and maybe hold a uh, in these days of um, the plague, uh, a Zoom meeting to uh, further discuss it with anyone who might want to. Thank you.